Alrighty, folks, and we are back. The recorder crashed. Um, so we were on question three, I believe. Um, the correct ordering of the steps in the scientific method is, and the folks here uh, correctly identified uh, idea, uh, no, D, idea, research, uh, hypothesis, experiment, and theory. All right. Um, there's one step missing from here, of course, and it is law. So this has the most of them. All right. Um, these uh, next two questions are fairly new. Um, they came about um, really after COVID. And uh, again, you know, me trying to justify science, sure, maybe. Um, me trying to help you guys if you still haven't grasped the whole thing that's going on with science yet. Uh, help you try and grasp that idea, yeah, maybe. But um, the idea behind the scientific method is that uh, is this a bing, bang, zippity, zip, 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 quick process, or uh, we got to stop and think about stuff and trial and error and yeah, 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 very slow and laborious process. For a little pun there with the lab on it. Real funny geology jokes are usually science jokes are bad. Geology jokes are even even worse, but. Um, so the nature of science, uh, thoughts and ideas are static, uh, unchanging, or, or they're dynamic and evolving. Yeah. Yeah. Again, I was trying to make these fairly, uh, you know, no brainers for you, but, um, did just want to reinforce those points. All right. So nature of science, um, wrapping that part up, moving on to the atomic review stuff. A uh, subatomic particle or particles that contribute significant mass to an atom. What do we got here? What do we got here? Any choices? Make sense? E, yeah. So this is something, and I, I noticed this in a handful of you guys. You're, you're, you're worried that you're going to run out of time on a test, um, so you're racing through, or you just think you know everything. And I don't mean it that way, but I'm just saying, you know, bless you. You think you, you know the answer. I am one of those teachers you need to read them all, okay? Because, yes, uh, if you stopped at, at neutron, neutron does have significant mass, but guess what? Proton also does. So um, there's an answer down there that lets you pick both, okay? And I, do, I don't do that to, to be tricky or anything like that. A lot of these questions uh, came from short answer, fill-in sort of things, okay? And um, the easiest way, the best way, I'd like to think, to turn them into a multiple guess question um, is to sometimes we have to have these, these multiples, okay? So please, please, please don't stop at the first right answer on my test. It's, it's probably great advice for anybody's test. But I, I, I do do this all right, with some frequency. Another hint, uh, scientists aren't sure is, is hardly ever the right answer. You will see that occasionally on some of mine. Basically, I just needed to come up with a fourth answer. Um, but, uh, you know, every so often it, it might be the right answer, but typically not. It is a science class after all. We do like to pretend we know what we're talking about. So both protons and neutrons contribute significant mass. Uh, the, the whole point of that significant there uh, is because of the next question. Okay, things can't be massless or they wouldn't be matter, um, but they can have no significant mass. And uh, that there is our friend, the electron, right? All right. Okay. All right. Of all these guys, uh, who lives in the nucleus? B, neutrons, anybody else? Oh, he said E? Okay. So, yeah, both B and D, protons and neutrons, live in the nucleus. Um, who lives outside the nucleus? It's not the next question, but since we're here, the electrons. Good. We'll see that in a moment. All right, which of these vocabulary words indicates the number of protons? Which word? Which term? D, atomic weight, uh, or atomic number, or atomic mass, all right, or molarity. So we want to see uh, atomic number here, all right? Now, difference between mass and weight 
in, 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 in science here, we should almost always use the word mass, okay, if this were uh, the correct answer. Weight is definitely not, and molarity is another chemistry word. All right, so number of protons is atomic number. That's the one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, going across, labeling all the boxes. The number at the bottom, all right, remember the two things that have significant mass, protons and neutrons, that gives us our atomic number. I'm sorry, that gives us our atomic mass. Sorry, brain fart. All right, but still, never wait. It's atomic mass. Now, what's the point of this? Because we live in a, you know, we're surrounded by gravity. We won't go there, but uh, they can vary. So they, they like to say mass. They like to say mass. All right, uh, next page. All right, so when an atomic mass is more than twice the number, a handful of you did miss this one, okay? What happens if you change protons? It was one of the previous questions. If you change protons, you change the element. You change the atomic number, all right? You can't mess with the protons. The only thing you can mess with in order to give yourself more mass is by adding or subtracting a few times um, neutrons, okay? So... Um, when the mass is more than twice the atomic number, it's because of extra neutrons. And it's apparently not a question here, but we called that an isotope. All right. A uh, substance that cannot be broken down into other substances by ordinary chemical methods, in quotes, because that is a direct quote out of not just our PowerPoint, but uh, whichever textbook I used it. For that years ago. Uh, what is that? Is that an atom? Is that a compound? Mineral? An element. Yeah, it is an element. All right. And we talked about a few problems inherent in that definition, um, but for our purposes, it, uh, it gets us through right now. So an element is something that cannot be broken down into other substances uh, under normal circumstances. What do you call it um, when you blend a couple of elements together? Compound, all right, compound. Um, there is a very similar question you'll see in a little bit, and those two questions, this one and that one, will make it all the way through to the final. Um, a substance composed of one or more elements. What was that one? It's out, of, out of context, but yeah, it was a mineral, okay? Um, so the, the key here with the, with the compound is that it's two different, two or more ingredients, all right? The, the problem is, and you guys are right at the point now where you're taking the, the mineral test, uh, many of you, um, you know that there is an elemental group. They're only composed of a single ingredient. So that's really the key word to separate those two definitions out, okay? Yes, maybe it's too late for this test. Um, I, I, did, I did say it during lecture, but... Um, certainly the next time you don't want to miss these two again. So two or more elements is a compound. All right, now we're breaking it down into the smallest pieces parts. We got the smallest unit of an element versus the smallest unit of a compound. Which one is which? Elements are made of atoms. Compounds then are made of, well, yeah, but the smallest unit, molecule, yeah, yeah, molecules, all right. So this was that, uh, that pluralization rule, for lack of a better word, all right. Um, if, if, again, if it's a single ingredient, we say it's an atom, it's the smallest pieces part. If it is uh, two or more ingredients, a molecule is the smallest pieces part. And I know we keep de redefining the smallest pieces part, right? Because then there's those dang quark questions. Um, it's all a level of, of how much focus you're, you're, you've got in. So speaking of which, uh, elementary particles. Uh, quarks are elementary particles. Electrons are elementary particles. A proton is made of quarks. So that can't be a choice. Um, and a smallest piece of matter that can exist. I should have said, as we currently know, 
Uh, but since you have at least two right answers here, okay, uh, I could have done this another one of those, you know, A, B, and C are all correct answers sort of thing. Um, but I went with the opposite question this time. Which one of these is not? So uh, what we're looking for here, of course, is that uh, the only one of these that is not elementary, a proton. All right. Now, most importantly, why did I put you through all this crap? Um, well, I had a handful of reasons, as it turns out. So we, we talked about atoms and protons and neutrons and stuff because that's how we make elements. Uh, we care about elements because, well, that's how you make minerals. We care about minerals because that's how you make rocks. And we care about rocks and minerals and elements because the Earth is made up of all that crap. So, boom. All of the above. All right. Again, please read all the answers. All right, switching gears again. This is into the um, investigating the Earth PowerPoint now. What gas are you sucking the most of in right now? A is not a gas. Oxygen is his second choice. Nitrogen. You are nitrogen breathers, all right? Um, we love we love our oxygen, don't get me wrong, but uh, the primary gas, I think it's right around 70% or so, is uh, nitrogen, okay? Oxygen drops way down to 20-something, so, yeah. So the second most common gas, oxygen. <laughs> well, you won't the next time. You won't the next time. All right, and why do we have an atmosphere? Other than outgassing, etc., why does it actually stick around? Gravity. Gravity. Good. Good, good, good. All right. Speaking of gravity, gravity holds all those particles really close to the Earth. Okay? So the atmosphere is thicker closer to the Earth. As you go up, it gets thinner. Somebody was just lecturing me because, well, you know, I'm massively overweight and so on and so forth. And I'm headed to Arizona this summer to go hiking with scouts. And they're like, you know, you're going to be at about 4,000 feet. I'm like, yes, I do know that. And it's going to be a little different than breathing at, uh, you know, Utica sea level, which I think we're at, uh, what's the uh, elevation in Utica, New York? It's like two something, isn't it? 456. All right. So we're at 400. I'm going to be at 10 times higher. Um, and uh, so, and you knew this, right? You see these people climbing Mount Everest and everything, and they've got those air masks on and, uh, and um, the Sherpas, right? They're specially trained and they're, because they're used to that thin atmosphere. Or if you've been lucky enough to make it out to Colorado and go up and high in some mountains and stuff, um, you know that the air is thinner up there. All right. So that's all we're asking you with these questions right here. Um, is, is stuff that you, you pretty much already know if you stop and think about it and apply it. That's the important part. All right. So both air pressure and air density, one decreases because of the other. Pressure decreases because density decreases. Okay. Um, so they decrease as you go up. Now, temperature, temperature vacillates wildly. First it decreases. Then it kind of stays the same for a little while. Then it actually increases. Then it decreased again. And then remember, it just went, kept going up, 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 up off the charts. So I didn't type all that out. What we gave you was a it varies. Okay. So while air pressure and air density decrease, temperature fluctuates a good bit. Not sure those two make it to the final. What atmospheric layer do we live in? This one makes it, I think. We live on the lithosphere, but we're talking about the atmosphere, so troposphere, yeah. Yeah. All right, uh, still talking about the atmosphere. As you go up, the temperature goes down, and we've got a vocabulary word for that. Okay, that's lapse rate. Problem is, these are all real words. One exception, geothermocline. I kind of made that one up. Uh, thermocline they use in water. 
you've ever had a biology class, you might have heard about thermocline. Um, geothermal gradient is actually a word that we use a little later in this test. That's the temperature increase as you go into the Earth. And then lapse rate is the decrease as you go up through the uh, troposphere. So these are all real words. That might have made this one a little more confusing for you because they weren't my usual silly answers. 25 is all about ozone, O3. Why do we like ozone? C, what does C say? Ultraviolet radiation, yeah. Uh, ozone is a great UV filter. Great UV filter. All right. Uh, Elwin, by the way, where does ozone live? We like to see ozone in the stratosphere. All right, in the stratosphere. Twenty-seven is another one of those that uh, has multiple answers. Magnetosphere and which one, B or C? C. C. Van Allen belts. Now I grew up when there were Van Halen belts, but they were belt buckles primarily, big ugly things. That was a rock band back in the day. So A and C. Remember, the Van Allen belts are a special part uh, within the magnetosphere. And um, they, too, even though it's captured incoming radiation, um, they actually serve a, a purpose. They act as a shield uh, themselves. So Van Allen belts can be a little confusing. All right, what does the rotating core of the Earth make for us? Magnetosphere, yeah, all right. Magnetosphere, that is um, not just uh, our force field, okay, of protection. The rotating core of the Earth also gives us um, the way we achieve that magnetosphere is by polarizing the energy. We have our North Pole, our South Pole, the positive and negative, the battery terminals, if you would. So uh, pretty important stuff. Um, and uh, they've made a few... Uh, Hollywood, uh, not horror movies. That's not the, quite the right word about. Uh, but when the pole, when the core gets messed up, uh, things will go very poorly for us. That that much is true. Um, but uh, you know they had to Hollywoodize it, of course. All right, this one uh, folks miss every so often, and I feel bad about it uh, because you, you you miss it because you pick uh, this first answer here, which is totally true. All right. Uh, the seasons are caused by the distribution of the sun's energy between 23 and a half north, 23 and a half south. Hits the equator twice as it passes through there. We, we heard that. I talked about it for 15 minutes. Um, but, and, and maybe it just deserves its, its own question. I, I don't know. Um, the reason that the sun's energy bounces between 23 and a half north and 23 and a half south is because the earth is tilted. All right. It doesn't spin straight up and down. Next time you pass a globe, take a look at it. The axis is off. Now, whether or not that's actually off 23 and a half degrees from perpendicular, I suppose it depends on how good of a globe you actually bought. Okay? But it is definitely tilted, leaned back, and it's not just so as you spin the globe, you can look rather easily at what's on top. That's true as well. That's a nice perk of it. So this, this fact that the Earth is, is tilted is, is really important. Otherwise... The sun's energy would always just stay on the equator. So these are both true. And I hoped by giving you two variants down here that it would, um, you know, maybe put off a little flag for you that, oh, wait a minute, maybe I really ought to reread these guys. Um, so we're looking for A and C here, which is, in fact, D. All right, I update these depending on what semester I give the test. Um, we're headed into spring, so I made it for the vernal equinox. But in, in all seriousness, whether I had said the autumnal equinox or the vernal equinox, the correct answer is the equator, right? Because at every equinox, the sun points at the equator. So, But I still update the question.
So application level question. Is the sun on its way back up to the equator or on its way down to the equator right now? Up being headed north, down being headed south. What do your classmates think? Yeah, yeah, it is. So our shortest day, which again um, is, well, it's actually right here. I was going to say I changed this question, but I didn't. Our shortest day was the winter solstice, okay, December 20-ish something, 2021, 20, 22. They bounce us around. That's when the sun is shining at 23 and a half south. Okay, that's why it's our winter, their summer. So uh, this entire time, it's working its way back up to the equator. Once we hit March 21st, it's going to keep moving up to 23 and a half north, which will hit in June. Okay, that's the way it works. And I just answered these couple questions here. All right, here's the same couple answers. Oh, this is something else that I do. Um, usually you'll see them much closer together. But, um, like, I, I can't remember if the mineral group questions are on here. I tend to make answer sets, all right, where you will see um, the same answers three or four questions in a row. That's usually a good hint that uh, we're going to use all those up. Every so often, you know, you, you might see something if I'm really trying to drive a point home where you might choose the same answer twice. But uh, typically, you know, please allow process of elimination if you don't know, if you're guessing, okay. Please use process of elimination. Well, we use these other guys, and I've seen these same four answers four times, so it must be this last answer. All right, that's 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 better than randomly guessing. Um, but uh, so you saw these four answers a little while ago. Again, they're not right next to each other, so you might not remember. Um, so going into the Earth, a temperature increase. That there is the. Uh, Geothermal gradient. Geothermal gradient. Happen to be pointing just to the other word, but. All right, radius of the Earth. Yeah, 4,000 miles. We're looking at B here. 4,000 miles. And again, this is an approximate. Oh, good. I do have the word approximately there. We've got very high mountains. We've got very low valleys. We've got ocean floors. We've got valleys in the ocean. Okay, so. Uh, it really depends where you're measuring it from, but for all intents and purposes, I mean, you know, we're looking at about 4,000 miles from any point on the surface of the Earth to the core. And it's not like you could go there anyways, right? All right. Uh, the core of the Earth, we know, is two parts. Uh, the question is, is uh, what order do the two parts go in? Because remember, we had inner core and outer core. All right. Um, so molten outer and solid inner, or solid outer and molten inner? Yeah, molten outer and solid inner. We got that metal, liquid metal sloshing around the solid metal to give us that energy field that we talked about a little while ago. All right, uh, which sentence best describes the mantle of the Earth? Now, while they are waging some arguments out there that there are some internal pockets of water, uh, that in no way, shape, or form typifies the mantle. Okay, um, there's a good chance that they are. Uh, there are some of these in oceans. They use the word oceans. That's that's kind of misleading. Um, but uh, there are some pockets of water here and there. They think nowadays. But uh, we want to talk about the mantle as a whole. Um, and we talked about the differences with pressure and gases. Yeah. You will see that, and that's when they say oceans. We're like, oh, cool, dolphins. Yeah. Yeah, and microbes and stuff. I know. We have, see, we haven't been there. We can't. They're looking at. They're looking at the equivalent of a sonogram. All right. Um, it's those seismic waves I mentioned one day passing and briefly. They're, they're, they're seeing these variations in in travel speeds of these waves. And it's looking like it could be um, really liquidy stuff. And they're assuming it's water. Now, in all fairness, we've got water going down into the mantle anywhere we've got a plate boundary where they're, you know, so sure, 
but the assumption's always been that it's boiling right off, kind of like if you've ever, I don't know if you've ever worked as a fry cook, but if you get water in a fryer or ice crystals in a fryer, it's, it's not good. Um, so we just assume that the ocean water going in was doing the exact same thing. Or they've been there for the last four and a half billion years, just these pockets of water. So, um, because again, if they're coming out of the volcanoes, um, where's that steam, where's that water vapor coming from? So they've, they've always thought something was there, but now apparently they've got a little bit of evidence about it. But critters and even the loosely defined, you know, blue-green bacteria that we talked about, that's a tough one. That's a tough one. I'm sure someone will be writing a paper on it in a decade or two. So if there's four and a half billion years old, that's like very recent. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Well, yeah, there is that, too. There is that, too. Um, yeah, we've got enough problems with the permafrost thawing and all these semi-ancient things coming out of, not monsters or anything, but bacteria and viruses, so on and so forth. I'm sure, again, Hollywood will jump on that, though, and have somebody thaw out of the northern uh, Russian permafrosts. We've already got a big gaping hole to hell up there, so, um, from a collapse and an explosion of methane, so. Neat stuff. All right. This is a wonderful example of why, if you had the opportunity to take this test on campus, I told you you ought to. Um, even though I showed you this uh, power uh, graph, uh, it's not a graph either. I can't talk this morning. I showed you this image in the PowerPoint. We talked about it in class. Uh, again, after you know 35 questions, your brain could be a little jumbled, and you're like, "Oh hell, what am I looking at?" Um, this is just our layers of the Earth diagram, but it's it's killing two birds with one stone, so to speak. On the right side, we've got the crust mantle core core. But on the other side, we've got the lithosphere and the asthenosphere. And again, depending on where your brain is at the moment, I suppose it is kind of easy to say, oh, yeah, this A over here, that's pointing to the surface of the earth. That's probably the crust. And, and then, you know, D actually isn't even touching anything. Wait, which one of these is an atmosphere? You know, you can get all confused. I understand that. Let alone something we found out. Um, I, and I still think it might have been a function of screen size because not everybody saw it. But some of the answers, yeah, it's doing it right here on mine. All right. It started off with the words above it. And then by the time we got down there, well, for some stupid reason, mantle, which goes to this square, is right here. Outer core, which goes to this square, is over to the side. It, it messed it up. And a couple of folks that were sitting here, you know, they were actually able to say, hey, wh what's going on? Um, as always, now you folks at home, as I said, you could always email me with a question. Some of you did email me after the test, which is almost as good. Um, but it is luck of the draw whether I'll you know answer the email while you're actually taking the test. But the, these folks on campus here um, had the opportunity to take it in person uh, as well. So that's what I'm, I'm talking about. So anywho, a, a number of ways to possibly get confused here. Uh, but in the end, hopefully you just kind of focused more on the diagram than the silly answers and tried to figure it out. And so with that in mind, um, well, let's start with C here. What is C pointing to? What's here in the middle? The mantle. Good. What's on the outside? What's on top of the mantle? The crust. Good. And we got two layers of core, which is this one in the middle? Inner. And then on the outside, the outer. Okay. All right. So. Crust, mantle, outer core, inner core. Over here, we got those other two words, lithosphere and asthenosphere. Which one is who? A, lithosphere, B, asthenosphere. Is he right, you guys? Probably, more than likely. Yeah, yeah, yeah he's right. He's right. So uh, what we were looking for here, again, and, and we never, as teachers, we don't really know, especially when we tra tra uh, change change uh, operating systems like this, you're never really quite sure what you guys are going to see on your end of things, um, you know, how it plays out, because we're in sort of programming mode, so to speak, when we're making the test, and it definitely doesn't look like what you guys see. Um, so the idea was that you were to put the letters of the correct answers in here. Um, some of you 
decided to retype the words, that doesn't really help much because, you know, asthenosphere, and then if you wrote the word asthenosphere underneath the asthenosphere, well, thank you, but it doesn't, you know, it doesn't tell me which layer is that. So um, this is where, if all else fails on a piece of paper, you can just write the damn word next to it and hand that to me, and I'll yell at you and tell you to go fill the answers back in. But you get my point. You, you can talk to me. You can ask questions. So, um, anywho, there's not a whole lot of labeling diagrams in this class. Uh, if we do soils this semester, you'll see one there. But um, but diagrams are a, a pain in the took us to uh, put onto onto online tests. They just there's no good way that replicates matching on a piece of paper for some reason. Never realized it was such a complex art. All right, so getting towards the end here, going back, uh, really big picture kind of stuff, and talking about the formation of the Earth. But before we do that, we need a solar system first, and then we need a, uh, a universe before that. Uh, so let's go all the way back. Actually, I didn't ask you about the universe. That's right. Well, we just got solar system this time. So how old is the solar system, y'all? Four and a half billion years old, which appears to be answer C, 4.6 billion. Good. Uh, how old is the Earth? It's the same. Okay. Hopefully you guys were consistent there. All right. Or at least didn't make the Earth older than the solar system. That happens, though, sometimes on your tests. And um, why? Uh, how do we know that? What did we get a, a hunk of to, to date that? An asteroid, okay? We do have some very old Earth rocks. They come in at about 4.3, all right? But the asteroid comes in, and all the asteroids we look at come in around 4.6. And um, we're able to do this because of something called the solar nebula here, all right? And then the, almost the more important question is, um, you know, why do we need to do this? And that's as we discussed in class, you know, weathering and erosion and just the, uh, the amount of time that those rocks have been sitting out there building up um, on the Earth, it's really hard to find um, stuff that's that old. It's here. We'll eventually find something that's dated 4-6, I'm sure. Okay. But um, they're just way down at the bottom of the pile, you know, after four and a half billion years, even with mountain... Uh, building events, you know, releasing some of the stuff that's that's deeper down, even with weathering and erosion, making sedimentary rocks. Think of how many times those, we haven't done the rock cycle yet, but you guys are familiar with it, all right? Think about how many times we've circled through that rock cycle. Um, that stuff is, is really filtered down by now. But these meteorites, these asteroids that are floating around out in space, that's essentially pure, untouched material, you know, since day one, cosmic radiation aside. But um, the folks in charge don't seem to think that's an issue. All right. Anywho. Almost done. Almost done. As the Earth's crust uh, cooled, it shrank, it cracked. What happened next? This sounds like one of my uh, multiple answer ones here. Did gases escape from inside of the Earth? Yes. Did lava flow out from inside of the Earth? Yes. Did it then shrink back down and swell up again? No. All right, so those first two are probably good choices then. And I could have thrown a none of the above in, but that seems sort of meaningless at this point. So, yeah, the first two things. Outgassing happened and the worldwide volcanism. Worldwide volcanism is why the outgassing, of course. Um, the earth cracked open, she bled, all the lava came out, and with that lava came all kinds of wonderful gases. All right, well, with all those gases, uh, we didn't just sit there and watch it and be pretty. Um, we had uh, the sunlight there breaking it down into hydrogens and oxygens, all right, which uh, was very beneficial to us in the end, as it turns out. We gave that um, process a vocabulary word. What do we call it? B. Well, we called it photochemical dissociation, all right. Uh, photosynthesis is a process but not this one. Regassing, not a process. Outgassing uh, is, well, what just did all this. 
And then overall ozone rectification theory. I'm rather proud of that one. I don't know that I'll ever have a chance to use it as a real thing one of these days, but that one there is a faker. All right, we're jumping ahead about 3 billion years. Actually, about a billion years, I'm sorry. Um, so first fossilized evidence of life comes in uh, a billion years later to, to three and a half billion years. All right. And what did we find in said rock record? Cyanobacteria. Good. Good, good, good. Using the proper name. All right. It used to be they thought it was algae. All right. When I was in school, they were calling it blue-green algae. Um, now they're calling it bacteria. I happened to uh, actually share a table and a dinner with um, one of the folks that was uh, responsible for the name change. I, I didn't know it at the time. Um, our name is Lynn Margalis, and if you've ever heard of Gaia or Gaia hypothesis, it was a crunchy, nutty sort of 70s uh, love the earth thing. Uh, but it was it was a science based, and how the earth was earth centric systems and everything like that. Um, I'm a I'm a Gaiaist. If you hadn't noticed, I you'll hear me say the earth does this, Mother Nature does that. That's that's her idea. Um, I was uh, and James Lovelock. So this is Lynn Margallis and, and James Lovelock. I was at a conference, and uh, these folks that I've been wandering around with all day. Were trying to convince me to stay for the dinner and the guest speaker, and I'm like, "Yeah, I don't need a forty-five dollar chicken cordon bleu. I'm good. I, you know, I'm just gonna. I live five hours away. I'm just gonna drive home." I'm like, no, no, no. You got to hear this. This is our. It's our teacher. You got to stay. Okay. So we're eating dinner, and there's this little old grandma lady, even had a shawl on and everything, sitting there at the table with us. And she was very polite, and I didn't read the thing, so I didn't know. I was introduced to her, but I didn't process anything. So then they finish dinner, and they invite up the guest speaker like they always do. And they said, ladies and gentlemen, Dr. Lynn Margolis. And the little old grandma sitting next to me goes up and starts, uh, goes up on the stage and starts talking about crawling through the sewers of France. I'm like, wow, okay. Um, so she, you know, said a whole bunch of things and they've been doing this research over the last decade and, and really I was at a, it was a science teachers convention. Um, so she wants to get the word out to the science teachers. Okay. That we need to stop calling it, uh, algae and we need to call it uh, bacteria because now that they've gathered so many specimens and they've compared this and compared that, and they've looked at the fossilized stromatolites, they've looked at modern stromatolites, they've looked in, apparently in the sewers of France for some reason. Um, they're quite sure that it is not algae. So, uh, so to this day, probably 15 years later, I'm still sharing that story. So if uh, you come across anyone who says, oh yes, blue-green algae, you say, no, no, no. It is blue-green bacteria. Why? It's bacteria. Did you miss my story? No, I didn't see it. When we first learned about it, well, probably in the same context. I said, you may have heard it called algae. I said, but it is not. It's now, it is, it is blue-green bacteria. And yeah, that was the whole point. Because something, the high, it hasn't necessarily caught up to the, the middle school and the high school teacher. I don't mean to stereotype like that, but it doesn't, it, it doesn't always filter up. And like I said, when I was in school, it was undoubtedly still called algae. So um, they've reclassified. If you guys took a biology class, They've even added a, uh, they've redone the kingdoms of bacteria uh, since, since I went through. It was Monera back then, and now they split it into eubacteria, and, um, which means true bacteria, and the uh, archaea bacteria, um, archaebacteria. And, uh, and these, it's all part of that, but even though algae is in a totally different realm completely. But I think it came out as a function of that stuff. But no, not a trick question. I just tell long, wandering stories sometimes, and if you get if you fade out in the middle, you might miss something. So I apologize if you missed that one. Okay. All right. All right. Anywho, uh, organisms responsible for filling up the air with oxygen, which is those cyanobacteria, by the way, um, also build structures that fossilize. We call those structures stromatolites. Yeah. 
And again, if you half read that question or read it really quick, you might think it's about those chloroplasts, excuse me, which are responsible for making the oxygen. But we're asking about the structures, the structures. All right, scrolling right along here. Uh, BIFs, what are BIFs? Iron deposits, good. What does the B stand for? Now, this is a tricky question if you're only half paying attention. Yes, B for banded, but what did I give you as another option? Biological, and they did come from biology, so that was tricky there. But yeah, banded iron formations, um, they are the source of the world's iron supply, and they are also billions of years old because they accumulated, they started accumulating once we saturated the oceans with oxygen, which, uh, well, while we were saturating the oceans with oxygen, which was a very, very, very long time ago. So all this iron that we're mining to make all the stuff that we make out of steel, okay, um, is has been there for a very long time. It is, uh, talk about limited resources, that is, is certainly uh, one of them. Arguably, coal makes itself faster than we're going to get more of this. So uh, A, B, and C are all correct. Uh, closest star to the Earth. I almost threw this one out, but I just wanted to make sure you guys got this one right. No. Proxima is the next closest star. Well, except for the sun. Yeah. Yeah. That is, well... <sighs> What is shining through the window right now? Proxima Centauri? No. All right. Anywho. If you only missed one question, then that's that's you're doing good. Don't worry. Uh, so we talked about that because we talked about solar nebula theory. It's a little out of place right now, question-wise. But this stuff was discussed when we did the solar nebula theory. Um, so that's when this question, what is a nebula? A nebula is a cloud of gas, gas and dust that can condense into a star. Uh, a nebula is full of elements. A nebula makes elements, right? Um, well, no, a nebula is full of elements. Um, a supernova makes elements. That's the next question. And uh, a nebula is also left over after uh, a star explodes. All right, so a nebula is all of these things. And again, if you just stopped at the definition, a nebula is a cloud of gas and dust and ran to the next question, you missed this one. And again, I feel horrible when I see that you guys did that because you knew, you know, one of these was right. Um, please, on the next test, everyone's grades should jump a little bit just for, you know, this lecture that I'm giving you right now. Read all the answers, please. All right, so as we were just saying, a supernova, that's when a star can ex explodes. Uh, so that's one way a star can die. Uh, supernovas are awesome because they allow fusion that doesn't typically occur in a star itself. Uh, so we get stuff uh, up in the rest of the periodic table, past iron, and uh, they also create nebulae. They create more nebulae. And this is where stellar evolution comes in and how stars cycle through. Uh, our sun are here that we were just talking about. They feel as a third or fourth generation um, uh, from a process of a third or fourth generation nebula. or So it's a third or fourth generation star. Um, does that mean the next time it blows up, and that nebula condenses that we'll get even more elements on the next periodic table should we decide to make one? Yes, it, it probably does mean that because um, at least it's made that point all the way up to here. So one would have to assume that it'll make more elements the next time. But you guys won't have to worry about that. Oh my God, we still have minerals to go through. This was a long test. Okay, uh, substance composed of one or more elements. So here's that question I was talking about 38 minutes ago. All right, so this is a mineral here because of the one or more elements. Remember, you do have the elemental mineral groups. Most commonly occurring element in the crust. Oxygen, remember, this is the one that doesn't seem right. Okay, because well, we want to think that there's oxygen is the number one in the atmosphere, and it's not. It's number two 
So, okay, yeah, let's go down to the solid rocky crust and wait, it's oxygen? Okay. But remember, it all plays into that SiO4, the silicates. There's four times, four times as much oxygen in that formula as there is silica. All right. So that's, that's all that oxygen. It is there. Uh, speaking of which, the second most commonly occurring element is silicon, which leads us to the silicates mineral group, which those folks that took the mineral test yesterday can tell you damn near half the minerals, right? <laughs> There's a lot of silicates, yeah. But we knew that going in because you made all those, those cards and... You know, you probably had as many silica cards as you had non-silica cards combined. So silicates are the most commonly occurring. Uh, so here's some stuff you don't hear all that much time. So what was that weird shape we talked about? C. C. Is it, so it's shaped like a C? Oh, a tetrahedron. Yes. Yes. Sorry. Um, so yeah, the tetrahedron, that pyramidal shaped thing that we talked about. Okay. Um, that is the shape that we have for the uh, silicate compound and uh, the crystal structure, and that's how we make all of those cool silicate minerals that you saw. I already gave this answer out a moment ago. All right, we've got one silicon and four oxygens, SiO4. This is so important, it does make its way to the final. Okay, the silicates, we gotta pay some respect to them. All right, here's just your mineral group question. CO3s, the what's's? The carbonates, good. Uh, capital S's is the sulfur group, good. Uh, minerals composed of only a single element we call the elementals. And extra oxygen, the oxides, yeah. One more page. Oh, now we're going through mineralogical examples. This guy writes just, he's beating a dead horse here. Fluorite and halite, halides. Oh, I only gave you one, all right. I thought, because there are, there is, I actually got rid of them for you, you're welcome. There's a whole set of questions that says, uh, which are examples of uh, chain silicates? Which are examples of sheet silicates? Remember that fun stuff? I got rid of that. I figured you had enough points at this point. So speaking of points, uh, this is something that you don't do a whole lot is write sentences. Okay. Um, there's this one, and then there's the next test, which will have definition of a rock on it. And then we're pretty much we're done writing things um, on tests. I told you in lecture, you're welcome to do this as bullet points or as um, sentences. It's up to you. I hand grade the last question, so everybody's test hopefully went up a couple points after uh, you took it. And um, what was I looking to see for mineral? I was looking to see four things. I was looking to see naturally occurring. I was looking to see crystalline. I was looking to see um, a fixed set of uh, chemical, physical properties. And the one I forgot is uh, inorganic, okay? Um, many of you had some very nice, long, uh, complex definitions that didn't have any of those four words in them. Um, so, yeah, and some of them reeked of Googling. Please don't do that in the future. Uh, you folks at home, you <coughs> folks on campus here, all right? Um, so, yeah, don't do that. But I had to see those four words. I do give partial credit on this. So if you came up with, you know, naturally occurring and crystalline, well, then you got two points, uh, so on and so forth. So I did my best to give you something. Um, but there were a handful of zeros I had to put because there was just, just nothing I could attach points to. Uh, and I feel bad about that. But you got to give me something. And I know that's exactly what you're doing is trying to give me something to work with by writing, you know, six sentences and all that. But... So, and it didn't help if you talked about rocks the entire time. A mineral is a rock that does that. No, no, it's not. So, uh, again, uh, 90, 80, 70, 60 is the grade scale, uh, but this thing tells you what grade you got anyhow, so you don't even have to do math anymore.
Um, this really does typify how I write questions, okay? Um, again, the content comes from the PowerPoints. Next time, if you ignore the PowerPoints for this test, please focus on the PowerPoints, um, are, which are lecture, uh, underscoring the importance of coming to lecture. Uh, but when it comes time to review, I'm not just saying, you know, just use the PowerPoints for the test. But when it comes time to review, please turn your direction to the PowerPoints. The night before the test is not the time to start reading all the chapters. All right. Not a good way to pass this test. All right, folks.